Amen, amen. Thank you, Brad, and thank you for all of those who led us in singing this morning. It's great to see you today as we're worshiping the Lord. Um, on a pew close by, you should have an outline of the message, and if somebody's already stolen yours, just look around on the other pews and pick up one of those where somebody's not sitting. You have my permission to move right now if you need to and, and get one of those so that you can take notes as God speaks to your heart in the next few moments. The uh, song we just sang talked about uh, the stone being removed from the grave of the Lord Jesus uh, to prove that he had risen from the dead. I was finishing Matthew in my daily devotions last week, and I was reading about that experience, and the Bible says that an angel of the Lord came down and rolled back that stone and then sat on it. Now, the Bible doesn't have any errors or any mistakes in it. It's perfect in every way. And yet you wonder why there are certain details there. Well, when the scripture says that the angel sat on that stone, I just paused there for a moment and I thought, well, why is that in the Bible? And uh, I can't think of any other reason than just to say God said about the resurrection as the angel sat there, so there. <laughs> I did it. Uh, just to prove to you that, that he's alive I'm just going to sit here until things transpire for a few more moments and let you see that he's not in this hole. He's not in this grave. He has risen from the dead. Amen. Our Lord is alive and he is alive. He is here. He is for you. He loves you and he wants to help you come to know him in a personal way through faith in Jesus. Now today we're in chapter 5 of Middleburg's book and the title of the message is What About Evil and Suffering? What about evil and suffering? And I have to say, I think it is probably the best chapter in the book. I, I certainly have enjoyed reading it. I've read the book a couple of times and then some beyond that. Uh, this is one of the greatest chapters I think he's written because it deals with one of the most pressing issues that people struggle with. If God is so great that he could raise his son from the dead, then why do we still have evil and suffering in this world? When you get sick or when you have problems, when you struggle with things, you, that same question lingers in your mind. Okay, Lord, I don't understand why I'm going through these things. It's like a lady I heard about. She was having a, uh, an emotional uh, struggle in her life, and so she went to a spiritual retreat, just thought she'd check in for a few days, try to get in touch with the Lord and get some better perspective on what was uh, going on in her life. And she registered, she stepped into the elevator to go up to her dormitory room, and there was one of the staff members of the facility that stepped on the elevator with her, and she just spoke to her, and she said, Honey, we're, we're so glad you're here. What brings you here to this retreat? And so within a few short seconds, she gave her a synopsis of what her problems were. She said, Well, my mother just passed away. My father's an alcoholic. I my marriage is on the rocks. My kids are driving me crazy. I've got all kinds of other issues in my life. The staff member looked at her and smiled, and she said, Well, honey, the Lord must love you a whole lot. And she stepped off the elevator and was gone. That's all she said. I'm sure that woman was left scratching her head. It's kind of like when my daddy used to whip me, one of the first things he would say was, Son, this is going to hurt me a whole lot more than it does you. Anybody ever have experience? Okay, this is going to hurt me a whole lot more. I had a hard time believing my daddy loved me <laughs> that much. And I want to say, well, daddy don't love me quite so much then if it's going to hurt like it's about to hurt in the next few seconds. This woman was struggling with life, and people are struggling with life. As I've said before, there's a story in, in every seat, in every pew, in every church, and for the scores of people that won't ever go to church on a Sunday morning, People are wrestling with life issues, and so we're wrestling with this question, why is there still evil and suffering in our world? So in thinking about a Bible verse, there are a lot of Bible passages we could use for this. I couldn't think of a better place to go than back to Job, because Job was a person who dealt with all kinds of suffering and evil in his lifetime, and yet he was a righteous man. He was a good man. We'll look at that in the Scriptures in just a few moments. And yet, all kinds of calamity happened to him. If you read Job chapter 1, you'll see that within just a few moments, the Scripture says that he lost his, his uh, fortune, that 
uh, all kinds of natural and uh, man-made disasters came upon him and took away all the material resources that he had. Then the scripture says that he lost his family for the most part. His children were killed in a tornado that swept across a house and destroyed them in just a few moments. And the scripture says he lost his health as well. Uh, we'll see that in the scriptures in a few moments. One commentator on this passage said, Job lost everything he had except a nagging wife. I, I don't know if that's quite appropriate to describe her that way. Maybe she, she was just really concerned about his condition and uh, was trying to help him along. That's what I want to think. But anyway, Job struggled with the question of evil and suffering. And you have friends that are struggling with the question of evil and suffering in their lives as well. And so as believers in Jesus, we have to come up with some kind of an answer, some kind of a response to point them to Christ, or else why would God bring them across our path? God's brought them across our path in their life, as messy as it is, so that we might point them to the Lord Jesus. So what do we say in response to them? Not that we have all the answers. The good Lord knows I sure don't, and I know you don't as well. But we have to have some kind of an answer, some kind of a response to people who are hurting around us. So let's jump off on that and let me give you some answers that you can provide for them. Here's the first one. You can say to them, the world is wicked. The world is wicked. You can certainly simply just agree with them that the world has catastrophic problems that we don't necessarily have the answers to. So first of all, don't pretend like nothing is wrong. I, I'm not really sure how to deal with Christians who pretend like nothing's wrong in the world. Folks, there are all kinds of problems that are wrong in the world today. I came up with a top 10 list. How about poverty, violence and war, climate change, drug abuse, disease, hunger, pollution, racism, education, and injustice. And if you think about it, you can just add on and on and on, ad litem, as they say, to that number. There's all kinds of problems in our world. How about mass murderers? How about child molesters? How about crooked politicians? How about those who cheat on their taxes? Uh-oh, preacher, you shouldn't have said that. Yeah, I can go along with all those other evils in the world, but let's not talk about if we paid our taxes. Do you watch the news? Do you turn on CNN or Fox News? And, and watch it? I do. I, I try to watch it some every day. But I'm telling you, I can't watch it for very long. It gives me a migraine because it's one problem after another, one struggle after another. And we live in an age where it's not just the problems that we know about in our community because we read the local newspaper. It is problems that happen in nations all over the world that are instantly broadcast to us through social media and through other channels that we are informed I like to think I'm an optimist, but there's only so much bad news I can take in a given day. The Apostle James deals with the problems in our world as he wrote to the first church years ago. He said in James 1.21, Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the implanted word which is able to save your souls. So, James says, the reason the world has problems, are you ready for this? Is because the people of the world make poor choices. The people of the world choose our own way rather than the way of the Creator, the one who made all that exists and had a plan for it in the beginning, and yet we chose a different path, and so we are often the source for our own problems. Now, sometimes we're not the source for our problems. Sometimes it's we have troubles that are not the making of our own. It's not because we did anything wrong. It's just something happened into a world that is cursed by sin. Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9 says, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? I tell you, when I turn on the news sometimes, it seems like I'm viewing a new level of moral depravity in our culture. And I'm wondering, how much further can America go before, the, before God levels judgment on us? 
Now, I don't necessarily like to preach sermons of judgment and try to scare people and things like that. But I'm telling you, God is a holy God. And he will only, his patience will only run so long. And then, and then he's going to withdraw his, his season of protection from our country. Or he's going to just out and out level judgment upon us. And that bothers me for my children. It bothers me for my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren if God gives me any of those in the years to come. What is going to become of our country if it doesn't turn back to God at some point? Our world is wicked. It's wicked. And there's an element of wickedness in you as well. You say, now wait a minute, preacher, you don't know me. I know human nature. And Paul said, one of the great militant missionary apostle who planted churches all over the known world of his day, he said, I, he said, there is no good in me. He talked about the evil nature that still lived within his flesh and how at times he was a carnal man and how he struggled with the, the difference between good and evil. And he said, I, I know the good that I'm supposed to do and, and, and sometimes I don't do that. And I know the evil I'm not supposed to do and sometimes I find myself doing that very thing. And he said, who will deliver me from this body of death? And then he went on to say, thanks be to God, Jesus Christ is the one who delivers us from that. So what can you say to people when they're suffering, when they're struggling? You can say, first of all, the world is wicked. You're not just making these things up. You're not just imagining these things. Our world is a wicked place. The second thing that you can say is that Satan is the source. Satan is the source for all of the evil and the suffering and the pain that we have in our world today, not God. Don't blame God for the bad things that are in our world today. God is not the source of that. He's not the author of that. We'll see that in Scripture in just a moment. But Satan is. Satan is the one who brought evil into the world. And it began in the Garden of Eden, as you know, back in Genesis chapter 3. The Scripture says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, You shall not eat from any tree of the garden. Satan came into the presence of Adam and Eve in the form of a serpent. Some say a snake. I, I don't know if he was a snake or not. He, he was a snake as far as I'm concerned, if I can use that term that way. And uh, he may have been a snake. I, I have never warmed up to snakes. Have y'all? I had a, a neighbor that... Uh, tracked me down when I was out in the yard last week. She came over and she said, Donnie, Donnie, Donnie. I said, what is it? She said, I just want to tell you, we saw, uh, I ran over a copperhead out here in the street and my neighbor cut its head off. You just need to be careful because I know you work out in the yard sometimes. Well, I said, thank you very much. And you can be assured if I see a snake, I'm going the other way because I don't like snakes. And uh, I know there are good snakes. I know they eat mice and all those kinds of things. God bless them. But I'm not going to get around them. I'm not going to be a friend. I'm not going to have them in my house. And if you have them in your house and I come to see you, it would be one of the shortest visits a pastor's ever made, I can assure you. I'm not going to get around a snake unless I can help it. Satan came to tempt Adam and Eve. Satan was once named Lucifer. He was an angel of light that was created by God, but he fell from his position because he tried to usurp God's throne he tried to take over God's throne, according to Isaiah 14 and verse 12. And since that time, God has referred to him in many other ways. He has referred to him primarily as Satan. Fifty-five times he is called Satan in the Scripture, which is translated to be opponent. He is an opponent. He is an adversary of God. And, and 61 times he is called devil in the Scriptures. And the word devil means accuser. He is the accuser of God those who love the Lord and who follow the Lord. And so Satan comes and he whispers in a heart as he did to Adam and Eve, listen, don't, don't listen to God. God doesn't have your best interest in mind. God's just trying to trick you. God's trying to fool you. And if you really want to be happy, this is the trail that you need to follow. And we're just gullible. We just listen to him and we follow him. And that's where sin enters the picture. And that's where so much chaos ensues so often in our world. Now, how many of you watched the football game last night? You know what football game I'm talking about. I don't have to tell you what that is. Okay, you know. When I came here uh, a long time ago, 
I was interviewing with, uh, I was down in the fellowship hall and the large group of Forest Lake people were there. It was, it, it was on that trial weekend, all right? And so one of the, uh, they were asking me questions. And so I was fielding questions, trying to see, they were trying to see if I was fit to be the pastor of the church back then, which is fine. I, I get that. But one of the questions they asked me was, can you be a Bama fan if you move to Tuscaloosa? Now, that's real spiritual, isn't it? Can you be a Bama fan if you move to Tuscaloosa? I was raised in the shadow of Ole Miss. I, I, I intended to go there until the Lord called me to preach, and I, didn't, I never got to go to Ole Miss. But I had an Ole Miss sticker on the back of my car for a long time. So can you be a Bama fan? My response was no comment. <laughs> of course I can be a Bama fan. Of course I am a Bama fan because I've lived here all these years, but I wasn't going to give them the satisfaction of knowing that at that particular moment. So as we watch the ball games, you know what Saban does when he gets ready to play an opponent? He will study the game films. He will study the recordings of the games that they've played recently, and he will watch for weaknesses in their offense and weaknesses in their defense, and then he will train his players. He will school them is a term we use. He will teach them to listen. These are the things you need to watch for, guys, when you get out there on the field because here's a weakness in their defense. Here's a weakness in their offense. Do you know that Satan has a game film on you? Satan has a recording on you. Satan knows everything that you've ever done. He's not omniscient. He doesn't, he doesn't have perfect knowledge like God does, but he has a great memory. And he knows what he's tried on you in the past. And he knows what works and he knows what won't work. And so he'll come back and he'll try that thing that's worked on you in the past over and over and over again until it stops working and then he'll try something else. Satan is aiming to undermine us in any way that he can. Jesus confronted some people that were deceived by Satan in John chapter 8 and he said, you are of your father the devil and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. Whenever he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. That's pretty blunt, isn't it? You want to know who Satan is? Jesus gives you great commentary right there on who he is and what his tactics are and what his aim is in your life. He rebuked those who were following Satan and rejecting him on that particular day and tells us because of what Satan does, all evil, all pain, all suffering comes from a world that's cursed by sin because we've said yes to Satan and no to God. God didn't make the world the way it is today. And ever since... You remember in Genesis, the scripture says that God took six days to create all that he created. And what did he do on the seventh day? The scripture says God rested. God rested on the seventh day. Someone said, what did God do on the eighth day? Well, God started working again. But this time his work is redemptive work. He's trying to redeem the world that's cursed by evil so that he can, it can be in the image that he first designed job lost everything that he had but he responded this way in job 121 naked i came from my mother's womb and naked i shall return there the lord gave and the lord has taken away blessed be the name of the lord so what can we say to people when they're suffering we can say first of all the world is wicked secondly we can say satan is the source not god but satan is the source and number three we can say that god is always greater God is always greater. It doesn't matter what you're going through. Our God is more powerful than all of that. And he will use what you're experiencing to expand his kingdom in some way. Remember the children's prayer that we prayed. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food. By his hands we all are fed. Thank you, God, for daily bread. I'm here to tell you today that God is great, and God is good. 
And sometimes we struggle with that. If God is great, why isn't he more good in my life right now? And if God is good, then why isn't he more great in my life right now? Why doesn't he intervene in my life and stop my pain and stop my suffering? I think Job had the same question. Now I want to challenge you to do something. I want you to, to uh, read through the book of Job and look at the issues that Job struggled with and see if you can identify the answer that God gave him for his questions. Here's what I think you're going to find. I've read through the book of Job many times. I have never found a, a, a stated answer to Job's questions. What I did find in the end was that God says, I am God, I am in control, I got this, don't worry, I'll take care of you. And if you read the last chapter, you'll see that God did all those things. But why those were allowed to happen to him in the beginning, there is really no clear explanation for that in the book of Job. And so that leaves us kind of scratching our heads. The scripture says in Job 1.1 1, 1, that Job was blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. I can't tell you how many times I've been in the hospital and some, some dear old saint stretched out on a hospital bed, struggling with pain, facing all kinds of disease and surgeries. And they'll look at me and they say, Brother Donnie, I don't know what I did to deserve this. And my response is, well, honey, you may not have done anything to deserve this. I don't think Job did anything to deserve what happened to him. Do, do you? A, amen? I, mean, I, I just don't see it in Scripture. Even God's bragging about him to Satan. Have you seen my servant Job? What a wonderful person he is. And that's where Satan aims at him. The Scripture says that Job was spotless. That's the word blameless. It refers to his morals. No one could have accused him at any place in relation to his morals. He was spotless. He was also straight. The scripture says he was upright, which dealt with God's principles and following God's principles. But then he was also submissive. The Bible says that he feared God. He feared God. Nobody could point the finger at Job and say, Job, Job, you're doing this because you are a lousy guy. Now, his friends did. <laughs> In a few chapters, you'd read through the book of Job. And say, Job, we know this happened to you because you cheated orphans and widows. You know, we, we know you did this. This happened to you because you did all kinds of things. But he knew it wasn't true. And so he's frustrated and he cries out to God. Job chapter 31 and verse 35, he said, Oh, that I had one to hear me. Behold, here is my signature. Let the Almighty answer me. He is praying to God from the depths of his heart. And he's saying, God, please answer me. Tell me what I did wrong. And, of course, God doesn't respond because he did nothing wrong. He, he wasn't sinless now, but he did nothing that caused all these problems in his life. He just had to know that there was a higher reason. And sometimes you just have to know there's a higher reason. You know, I struggled when my daddy died several years ago. My dad was my age, basically, when he passed away. And he was a flaming evangelist. I'm telling you, he was winning people to Christ. And he, he, he saw the horizon when his life was going to end. And he, he, he said, I don't know about you, but he said, I'm going to be talking to people about Jesus. I'm going to be sharing my faith. And he was. He was winning people to Christ. And when he died at the age of 67, I struggled as to why my dad would have to leave this world. And I saw others who didn't give a flip about God. And they seemed to have no problems. They seemed to have no troubles. And they were living a lot longer than him. Job had to know that there was a higher reason that he didn't understand at the time. And he just had to trust God. Isaiah 46, 11 puts it this way. Truly I have spoken. Truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it. Surely I will do it. And I'm telling you, sometimes when you don't have anything else to hang on to, when you sure don't have a doctor's report that sounds good, when you sure don't have tests that sounds good, when, when, when you look at your bank statement and it looks terrible, when all the signs are against you, you have to know that God is still working and that God is going to bring something good out of the situation that you're in. 
You just have to trust the Lord. And that's why Paul wrote Romans 8, 28, and we know that God calls us all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. God is working. God is working. And God will continue to work until he sends his son, the Lord Jesus, back to take his children home. And as he works, he's going to take all the stuff that's happening in my life, all the stuff that he either causes to happen or he allows to happen because he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And he'll take all of that stuff and he'll advance his kingdom in some way through it. Why do these things happen to us? Well, let me give you five short reasons, five things that can be good that can come out of the hard things that are happening to you. One is that it can help you come to faith in Jesus. One of the things I prayed Saturday morning, yesterday morning, um, we were on a prayer conference call uh, with several of our um, friends that serve in Indonesia. And I was praying about COVID, that God would help COVID to pass over quickly because of the, uh, the, the thousands, thousands of people that have passed away because of it and all the suffering that it's caused. But I prayed beyond that, God, would you use this to get the attention of our world? Would you use the pandemic to wake people up spiritually that they will come to you and know that you are Lord and you are God? So God, would you use the things that are happening to me to help someone come to faith in Jesus Christ? Evil, pain, and suffering in your life can also teach you to depend on God. When you're healthy, wealthy, and wise, as they say, you think you've got life handled, and then something comes and knocks the wind out of you, it can help you depend upon the Lord. It can help you turn your eyes toward heaven and trust in Him and, and lean upon Him. Evil, pain, and suffering can also help you grow in your faith. As you move through a season of something that's difficult in your life, as you depend up more upon the Lord, you'll find that just like a, a physical muscle needs to be exercised to be strengthened, your spiritual muscles need to be exercised to be strengthened, and God can strengthen you through those difficult times. Evil, pain, and suffering can help us identify with others as well. You know, it was hard for me to identify with people going through some types of surgery until I started having some myself. Somebody tells me, I got heart problems. I had to have a heart cath. You know, I got a stent, you know, those things. I said, well, God bless you. Well, now I got that, okay? And I can identify a little bit better with what they're passing through and know better how to pray for them and how to help them. So there's all kinds of reasons that, we, that God allows some of these things. And here's the last one I'll share with you. All of that evil pain and suffering that is happening in your life today can become a platform for you to share your faith in Jesus. It can become a platform. You can say, okay, I don't understand why this is happening, but let me tell you about my God who is with me and who is able to help me, and he can do the same for you if you'll trust in Jesus. Moses, when he's standing on the brink of the promised land, he's at Mount Nebo. I've been to that place. And look out over that. You look, you look uh, westward. You see a great panoramic view of the promised land. And Moses is standing there, and after 40 frustrating years of trying to lead the people of Israel through the desert, he knows he's never going to get to go into the promised land. I won't get into why, but he just knows he can't go into the promised land. God said, you can see it, but you can't go in. And here's what Moses said in Deuteronomy 32, 4. He said, God, his work is perfect, for all his ways are just a God of faithfulness and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. I want to be able to say that at the end of every season of evil, pain, and suffering in my life. And I want to be able to say that at the end of my life. God, you are right. You have always been right. You will always be right. I am here to bring you honor and to bring you praise. So what can we say? We can say the world is wicked. We can say that Satan is the source. We can say that God is always greater than whatever we're going through. And here's the last thing I think we can say and should say. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. When you encounter friends that are struggling with life, do your best to identify with them and understand their hurt and help them if you can. 
The devil is slandering Job. Man, he says, you know, God, the only reason Job worships you because you've been so good to him. You've been too good to him. But if you'll take all these things away and even take his health away, he will curse you. He can always have more children. He can always start more businesses and get rich again. But God, if you take his kids away, if you take his health away, he will curse you. In chapter 2 and verse 7, the scripture says, Then Satan smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Let that settle in for just a moment. Let me read it again. Satan smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. Now, we don't know what kind of disease Satan put on Job, but we know it was bad. We know the pain that he experienced is, is totally beyond our ability to understand. Here are some of the symptoms that he experienced as evidenced in the book of Job. Severe itching, chapter 2, verse 8. Insomnia, verse 4. Running sores and scabs, verse 5. Nightmares, verses 13 and 14. Bad breath, that's a given probably. Chapter 19, verse 17. Weight loss, verse 20. Chills and fever, chapter 21, verse 6. Diarrhea, chapter 30, verse 27. Blackened skin, in verse 30. His appearance was so bad, when his friends came to see him, they did not recognize him. He goes outside the city and he sits down in the garbage dump. And so his day consists of smelling sewage burn, scraping his sores, and begging for money. And listening to the young men as they would come by and mock him and make fun of him. That was his life. His friends looked at him and said, we, we don't even know who you are. But his friends came. We want to trash his friends as we read the, the rest of the book of Job. And there's something they have to answer to the Lord for. But here's what you have to say for them. They did come. The scripture says that they found out about his condition Chapter, 11, uh, chapter 2, verse 11 says, Now when Job's three friends heard of all his adversity that had come upon him, they came each one from his own place. Eliphaz, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shuhite, and Zophar, the Namathite. And they made an appointment together and come to sympathize with him and comfort him. They just got together and they said, Let's agree that we need to go see him. He's in a mess. We've got to go see our friend. And the, tri the distance they traveled was over 100 miles. They went and they journeyed to his place and visited with him. Now, they could have stayed at home and prayed for him there. They could have sent him a card. <laughs> they could have sent him a, a get well basket. They could have done all kinds of things. But the scripture says they went to where he was to be with him. And you know the best way that you can help people who are hurting in this world who are struggling with evil, pain, and suffering is often with your presence. It's not the nice things that you have to say. It is to be there, and your presence communicates that you care, that you care. A study of Americans, people in the United States, recently has said that we have fewer and fewer friends, real friends in our life today. With the advent of social media, you'd think we'd have all kind of friends, okay? How many friends on social media would you call at 3 o'clock in the morning to get you out of jail? You say, you assuming I'm going to go to jail, Brother Donnie? Well, I don't know. You might. You get in trouble. You get in real trouble. Do you, who are you going to call? Odds are it won't be the people on Facebook. It will be somebody that you've known and that knows you, that you have bonded together over a period of time. You've got some experience. Uh, hopefully it will be your faith experience. And you can call them and say, hey, I'm in a mess. Can you help me? So how many friends do you have? Real friends do you have? These were friends of Job. They were misguided friends in some way, but they were friends. And they came and spent time with him. 
Proverbs 17, 17 says, A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. You know, one of my favorite people in the Bible is Barnabas. In the New Testament, remember Barnabas? His name actually means son of encouragement. He's an encourager. And everywhere you see Barnabas, he's just encouraging people. He's just kind of picking them up. Don't you want to be around people like that? Or do you, do you want to be around people who are nagging and whining and critical and complaining? Don't you just love people like that and love to spend time with them? <laughs> we need to spend time with them so we can point them to Jesus. But I want to have some Barnabases in my life who can encourage me in the faith and who can lift me up, and that's what people need. So you can say to them, I don't know why you're going through what you're going through, but I want you to know something. I'm here for you. I'm here for you. And who knows how God will use that. Perhaps that will become a platform where you can share your faith. Maybe not right then while the tears are streaming down their faith, but it will become at some point in their life a place where they'll say, I know I can trust Donnie because he was there for me when I was struggling. And they'll want to know why. What, what is the reason for your hope? What is the reason for your faith? Let's pray. Father, this is such an, an ominous subject today as we deal with a world that's broken and we struggle in this broken world to live for you. And yet we know who you are. We know that you are Lord and God and we know that you, you love us so much. We know that you gave your son, the Lord Jesus, to be the Savior, not just of those who are gathered in this place or watching this worship service online, but for all mankind, Jesus died on the cross. And because of that, Lord, because of your great love, we know that there's something better than the evil and the pain and the suffering that we're going through personally or collectively in our world. And so we lean into you today, and we pray that all of those that are worshiping with us will do that as well. Help us to turn from whatever we've been trusting in and turn to you through your Son, the Lord Jesus, and know that as we walk through difficulties in life that you will be there with us because you said you'd never leave us or forsake us and that you will use the tough things that we're struggling with and bring good out of them to expand your kingdom. Lord, we trust all of this now to your keeping. In Jesus' name, amen.